Hi there, today I've got Rod Stewart tribute, artiste, act, call it what you will, in the studio with me. The wonderful Bob Wiper, who not only does he look and sound like Rod Stewart, he is a, a veritable cornucopia of Rod Stewart facts. And uh, th I, I've just never known anyone to know so much about anyone. Um, I don't know much, I can assure you. Compared to, <laughs> compared to all these people we've been speaking about in the fan clubs, I, yeah. I know nothing. Yeah. Uh, I'm just the tip of the iceberg. These guys know it all. <laughs> now, well, I've got to ask you, that look with the hair, the, the, you know, the fluorescent jacket and everything, yep. do you keep that look all the time or do you just bring it out for the shows? Uh, obviously, the jackets and shirts uh, st stay hidden away until showtime. Yeah. Uh, the hair, I'm afraid, is real and has to be something like this most of the time. Yeah. Uh, plus the fact now I'm getting uh, I'm getting this, the stage that people expect you to look like that when they meet you. Yeah. So they're disappointed if you don't. <laughs> but do you not get a couple of funny looks in the streets because it is quite an 80s hairdo? Well, that's right, and it, and uh, the insults vary depending on the, <laughs> the cleverness of the people delivering the insult. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes anything from there's Lemal to there's Elton John, you know. <laughs> so you get them all. Um, of course, because Lemal out of Kajagugu, yeah. his hair was more or less identical. Well, I, I've had to make the hair a compromise between the hair that Rod has had for 40 years in sort of 50 different poses. Yeah. So because I'm only representing Rod in, a, in one show, yeah. you've got to have a sort of cross-section of the look. And this one, I think, is the nearest. It's not too long, it's not too short. Yeah. Rod's is a bit shorter now. Yes. And it doesn't stick up just so much, uh, but it's got the same general... Right, uh, and you, you've got children, haven't you? Yeah, uh, three kids uh, and grandchildren. Right, grandchildren yeah, and, well. and did your kids ever go, oh, Dad, don't pick me up at the school with a head like that? <laughs> no, I, I think it's been the opposite. Um, it, it's just, uh, be, I've always been some sort of character involved uh, yeah. with, with what I do, so it's never been a real problem. Oh, that's good. And that's they, they know what I'm like, so yeah. uh, they expect it as well, I think. <laughs> well, talking about children, when you were a child, <clears throat> were you from a musical background? Um, you wouldn't call it that, um, <clears throat> you wouldn't say that because there was no music around me, if you like, in, in that sense, apart from the dance set record player, which yeah. everyone had. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, songs like Ned Miller singing From a Jack to a King, yeah. that, these were the early songs, and uh, you sort of say, well, how do we progress from there? But um, I found out Mum actually had a, a qualification from the Royal Academy of Music, and, oh, right. and so did my uncle. Uh, yeah. But she she scored higher than him. But he became a, an organist and keyboard player. Yeah. She never so. Uh, so there was music there was in, something in your there. genes, as it were. Yeah, and and uncle did encourage me at, be at the beginning. So, yeah. but. Um, even grandmother helping, saying, I'll buy you your first drum kit when I started out. So things like that. So know. was the drum the first instrument, the first thing you did musically? It was, yeah. Yeah. How old were you then when you got that kit? Uh, that Bet your mum was pleased. <laughs> <coughs> well, that, yeah, it was one of those things you didn't rehearse in the house. Yeah. And you had to get pads and everything to keep the noise down. But yeah. Yeah, it's all part of the fun of but, growing but, but up. But how old were you? Were you little? Or I was only 18. Old? No, I was 18, 19 before I started properly in bands. Yeah. And then it just zoomed in from there. Yeah. Um, and, and started learning backing vocals and... Uh, couldn't sing a note and yeah. suddenly they, they progressed into it. That's quite good. Can you sing a couple of songs lead now? Yeah. I would then develop into that and before you knew it, uh, I remember stepping out from behind a drum kit. Yeah. Um, starting to sing without a drum kit for protection and I felt <laughs> naked. Yeah. And that was really strange and it was the same feeling from there with a microphone with a lead on it to one with a radio mic. Yeah. Once again felt naked because there's yeah. no tie to the stage. Yes. Oh. <laughs> so these dear. were all things that you've developed and you have so to learn. You, you've you learned came, the craft. You came to it, when I say quite late, I know 18, 19 yep. isn't late, but most people that come in and, and have a chat, <clears> you know, it, when the junior school or senior school at the very latest, they knew that they were going to do this or that. That's what right. did you do? What, what did you train for when you when you were at school? You know what O levels, GCSEs, or whatever. What did you take? <clears throat> because what did you think you were going to be? At, at that stage, it was going to be a draftsman or something. Mm. Because my, my dad always said they got better wages than he got. Yeah. 
Um, he, he was uh, he was a, an electrician who did a job and went out every day and s was under floorboards working. Yeah. Said, get a job above ground, as he <laughs> called it. <laughs> so things like that, you would, he would say, go and find something else. Yeah. And then he, he looked at things with the draftsman side, and I thought I could do that, and I liked drawing, and I liked the, the technical measurement and all that. Yeah. So we did all that and, and went there and didn't like it and didn't work and moved on quickly. Yeah. What did you move on into? Uh, I think I started off um, testing out on sales, some, something in sales. Um, yeah. But so many jobs in the early days because in those days the factories where we lived started closing down and you ended up always looking for a job quicker than you thought. Where, where did you live? I mean, Kilmarnock, still there, yeah, born and bred. Kilmarnock, right. Yeah. And in those days we had Johnny Walker with the, the whiskey, we had um, Massey Ferguson tractors, yeah. Clark's shoes, all made in the town, the Glenfield and Kennedy hydraulics, wow. Glacier Metal. It's funny, again, th this, is, this is great, this chatting to you today, <coughs> because I'm learning things that I didn't know and little facts about different places. Yeah. So, but but they were all starting to shut down, and so that's right. So you had to go from you had to look job for to job. yeah, looking for work was um, getting more and more difficult, just mm. as it can be now for people. Oh yeah. There's a, there's a turn like that on the market just now, and that's why I, I, I'm so surprised that people can keep going positively, but. When you look back and you always see positive strains and that's yeah. that's what I latched on to then. Yeah. And I think I've still got that, which is what's keeping me going. Yeah. So so when all the different uh, places of work were closing down, you managed to have in, in the words of PC talk now, political correct talk, <laughs> you had transferable skills that you could go and do different jobs. Well if I didn't, I um I was I was very uh, adaptive. Yeah. And I would find a way of using what I could in something else. Yeah. And I didn't mind taking a total change. Yeah. Um, and I even went into a statistics office, uh, uh, counting toilets in Shanks Pottery <laughs> to make up reports for the general manager, things yeah. like that that you did. Yeah. And that was the very week that I was offered a six-week tour of Denmark and then got married and I had to cancel a six-week tour of Denmark with a big band at the time. Oh, no. So all these things all happened in, the, in yeah. a similar period, just as I'd met Maggie, my wife, yeah. who's, who's really Margaret, but has become Maggie well, for it's obvious be Maggie reasons. Maggie with, yeah. with, with Rod Stewart. So when did you do your first professional booking? When did you sort of first step on stage in anger, as a drummer, I presume um, it was? 22nd of December... 1972. All oh, right. <laughs> the Shanksy's Pottery Works Dance. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, but Playing with a huge band called the Merry Max, who were 10 piece. Yeah. And they, they, they said, well, give us a half hour slot because we were rehearsing in the, the, the actual Works um, Welfare Club. Yeah. So they said, well, it sounds quite good. Why don't you do a spot at the dance? So yeah. we got little progressions like yeah. that. Yeah. And then I think the next job we had was Deaf and Dumb Awareness Week, would you yeah. believe? <laughs> Yeah. And we couldn't believe that they wanted to have a band playing. Yeah. And then we understood as much as anyone else, this awareness was about making people enjoy themselves, no matter what, what uh, condition what the it was. Yeah. yeah. And th this awareness of deafness, that they wanted the flashing lights and they wanted to see uh, you know, if they could feel the, the music through the floor. Yeah. And we just made it happen. Yes. So that was that was a learning curve even then that all types of people want to enjoy themselves. Yeah. We have to make it happen. Well, funnily enough, I, I've been at a function, I've hosted a function for people that are profoundly deaf. Right. And there is always music there. Yeah. And they actually, one woman uh, told me that they feel it in their chest. Yeah. If it's loud, they actually <clears throat> feel the vibration in the yeah. chest. And everyone virtually was dancing in perfect time, moving to yeah. the beat. So you're right, it's just... It's Either different. through the feet or yeah. in the chest. Or yeah. in, in, certainly, I feel it... Oh, I'm hitting the microphone. <laughs> I feel it in the chest yeah. um, when, I'm, uh, when I'm at b the big rock concerts. Yeah. And that was uh, one of the early ones. I mean, that, that had a big effect on me. I was going to see Uriah Heep at the oh, Apollo right. Theatre in Glasgow. Yeah. It was my first concert. Yeah. And before the music, before the show started, they played music through the background system. Yeah. And to hear Pinball Wizard at that volume, oh wow! I'd never heard an, I'd never had an experience like it. Yeah. And it, yeah. it, it was, uh, it was amazing. You so. have to watch it because your ears ring for three days after if you're not careful. If you to. get it badly wrong. Yes, if you do. Now, um, mm. when did you decide to become a Rod Stewart 
tribute act because you've done all sorts haven't you up to up to that point mainly working in duos um, and uh, as a duo um, with, with a sing, I, I, I was then a singer, not a drummer or anything. That had long gone, yeah. and I became the singer and frontman, and worked with uh, good guitarists. And the guitarists that were with me always seemed to be a bit special. Yeah. So we, we we then chose songs that showed off one or other or both of us. Yeah. So that became it's really just showing off, isn't it? Yeah. That's, what the, that's what the job is. It is yes. <laughs> and I'm, I'm told I'm quite good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so that becomes part of what you're doing is, yeah. is building it into something visual as well. Yeah. And then uh, with Rod Stewart, um, if, if you were doing the thing with the duo, you needed a deep voice for Neil Diamond yeah. or Johnny Cash, and, and I delivered some of those way down low, you know. Yeah, way down low. <clears throat> and then you would yeah. come along and do Sting or Prince at the top end. Yeah. And to get those registers, uh, you really had to be in very relaxed mood. Now on a bad night in the winter, you could have a slight cold or something and it yeah. was quite difficult. And if you lost your voice, <clears throat> uh, one of the things I did was sing a couple of Rod Stewart songs right. because you used different muscles to get that sound. Yeah. Um, by relaxing and growling slightly and yeah. suddenly the, the whole voice would become clear and I could sing pop songs again and get through the rest of yeah. the night. So. so it was a bit of necessity as much as anything else. How yeah. long ago did you start your tribute act? Well, that, uh, we keep saying it's a year or two, but that's actually four years coming now. Right, <laughs> Just, so uh, so in this current incarnation, yeah. you've been Rod Stewart, it's been four for years. nearly four years. Yeah. Well, what we're going to do in the next bit, we're going to uh, take a listen to you and, and see an example of your work. So do keep it here. We'll be back after this short break in about two minutes.